afternoon session. My name again is Victoria Sampson. I'm with Secure World Foundation. We heard it here from some of our international colleagues about issues and concerns they have about space traffic management, which I think is a wonderful um, com um, complementary part to the conference, just because, as we know, space is inherently international, but oftentimes, especially in the United States, we tend to focus on the U.S. interest. So looking forward to a really great conversation, and just because we have a large group, I'm going to let them get at it. We'll be starting with Jose Miguel Lozano, talking about a way to go from collision avoidance services to space traffic management. Uh, thank you, Victoria. Thank you, the organization, for preparing the conference. So uh, I'm gonna. We have prepared a presentation of this between our original idea on the abstract and uh, the request for this uh, panel. Uh, I'm coming from the. I'm representing the GMB, which is a, a Spanish uh, technological group. But I'm coming from the uh, U.S. office from Washington, so it's a kind of <laughs> special international. And we will uh, see that uh, uh, we. I think we are a good fit in this international uh, session. So a bit of uh, a summary of uh, about uh, GMB, just uh, the, the main relevant. We are operating on uh, 10 countries or 11 countries. We have started from space uh, engineering and we are working on a, dif on a lot of uh, different markets. In most of the cases, bringing the innovation from space to other areas of activities. So in the area of flight dynamics, which is where we have uh, the SST uh, information, we are just going to I'm not going to enter on all of these details. The key points here is that we are, all, uh, apart from what we are doing in SST, we are also on the other side of the wall. We are providing the systems that we, uh, that uh, the operators use to generate information that is exchanged with the rest of the world. And this is, we have a good uh, knowledge of that part. And we have a pretty good uh, team of uh, flying Amish people, more than 160 engineers, 50 of them working on SST project in the more than six uh, countries. And we have uh, grown uh, significantly in the last uh, five years. So what do we do in the institutional market? So our first work started with ISA in the 90s. We were providing the systems for ESOC, the operations center, basically to monitor and to catalog the space debris. And then when the, the ISSA program started on the 2000s, we, were, we uh, provided uh, um, different uh, elements for the system and we were responsible for integration of the SST data center. Uh, and uh, in, the, in 2014, the European Commission started a program, the European uh, SST, the, which is a federation of national systems that was uh, initially uh, composed by Spain, France, uh, Germany, Italy, and UK. Uh, the, the Spanish uh, system, it has uh, a radar and different um, optical telescope and an, and an oper SST operation center that we lead the development and we operate under a contract from the Spanish government. Now this uh, European, sorry, this European uh, Union SST, uh, UK is out due to Brexit, obviously, and there are some other countries that has uh, entered, and I think we will get more information later from uh, Poland, uh, Portugal, and Romania. We also work uh, with uh, national programs, uh, basically with KENES, in which we provide different uh, activities uh, from SST simulators, cataloging functionalities. And this is basically related for uh, France has a space, uh, French space law that uh, imposed them some uh, important requirements to guarantee the safety of the French uh, 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 soil. And they have to, to do a, more than other countries are doing. And we are active in other uh, countries in Europe. We have uh, uh, teams working in Poland, Portugal, Romania, Germany and UK, and they provide uh, support to, uh, on the, that countries to develop this type of functionalities. And we are starting to do the same in the US. This is on the institutional side. On the commercial uh, market, uh, we have uh, our own uh, collision avoidance service. We provide uh, services to more than 80 satellites. And this software is also provided to some of the customers that want to have that uh, on, the ha on house. This is uh, possible because we have an agreement with US Stratcom to provide uh, 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 services related with SSA based on the SP catalog and some uh, additional processing. And we have experience working with all the customers and all the data providers in the, the world. So one of the things that we uh, understood from the request for this meeting was to explain capabilities. I'm not going to enter into details, but basically we can cover all the from uh, cataloging, scheduling, prediction of different events and so on. This is what we call the SST capabilities, but thinking on the STM uh, framework, we, we think there are other 
uh, non-traditional ST cap uh, capabilities that we have to cover. As I uh, said before, uh, being in charge of the flight dynamics uh, for the, the, the operations, uh, anything related with the ground segment development and how to connect with the rest of the STM world is very important. We, can, uh, provide, uh, pre we provide also precise of determination services, uh, and we work in missions in other areas, like for example, uh, the ESA programs for uh, uh, the British removal, we are providing the GNC component for, uh, for, for that satellite, or we are doing things like uh, providing the flight dynamics for, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh. for missions like LSAB. And we also provide additional uh, uh, services based on these capabilities. This is the first part. What this, uh, there are three slides here. How we see the, um, uh, the challenge and the, and the markets that, uh, strategies. Uh, the way we, we approach is first, we need to you need to develop capabilities. These capabilities are basically formed by research and development, internal research and development, or institutional programs. This uh, gives you the capability to solve a problem if somebody uh, wants you to solve that problem. Then the technology development is, uh, uh, is where you are able to create or you have things that you can uh, use to solve a problem and you don't have to start from scratch. We can think of, you have a, a propagator, a propagator would be a good example. You can, you can know how to propagate orbit. Next step is you know you have a propagator. The next step, if the ma market is enough mature, is to be able to have products that you can apply to a specific project very quickly and with a uh, low level or no uh, associated development. And uh, when the market is totally mature, you can also provide uh, services like what we were discussing before for uh, collision avoidance or services that we are providing for European Space Agency that we are uh, doing at GMB, the precise orbit determination for the Sentinel missions. It depends at the end of uh, different requirements, quality costs and uh, for the customers. Then the challenge, mm -hmm. I, sorry. There are some of them that I would not enter because uh, there has been explained before, uh, like uh, all the regulations and all the questions, all the, all the, lay, the international cooperation. We think that it's important to develop the market. There will be one point in which uh, the, the users of this STM, STM service will need to identify which are the things that they, are, uh, they want to pay for and which are the ones that they can be provided by free by the institutional. Uh, entities and uh, another one that is very important is the how to remove the barriers that can uh, uh, that uh, avoids this uh, cooperation. The next one is the modeling. There are some areas of the all this uh, business that need to improve the algorithms that we use, new improve the modeling, sensor uh, and data modeling, and this will require the the cooperation between the operations entity, the industry, and the academia. There, will, there not all the problems that we have to solve are on this side. But there are, to be able to have a market on STM, we need to, do, this is part of the problems that we have to solve. And another point that is important, it has been the, discussed by Dr. Kerso this morning about data access, but it's also very important integrity. We have a lot of, we work a lot in the navigation and uh, we, uh, a critical point on navigation is not just knowing where you are, it's knowing how accurate or how, how much can you rely on that. You have to be sure that it's not enough that 99% of the times it's, uh, it's uh, Correct. Okay. And the last point is what the opportunities that we see on the market. So the, we have opportunities that are the traditional service doing what we are uh, doing in, the, in this type of areas, including supporting the new missions like uh, the removal mission, missions that are, they are going to be a mission from a, a development point of view, but they are going to do something that is related with STM. Then non-traditional services, these are things that we do from time to time. Uh, you can use the capabilities that you have to do to improve things that are not strictly SST, like improving the, the, the orbit determination, improving the calibration, support missions in some particular, uh, particular phases in which you can have a, a critical issue like the orbiting, and you uh, help that entity to do that, the orbiting, in a more uh, a safer way. L uh, next point is going to be uh, the approach to the complete uh, value chain. This is, this is more a, a uh, enterprise culture, you can decide to take one particular activity and do absolutely everything, or you can uh, be able to provide, uh, to add value in all the chain. An example of this is uh, uh, we work for navigation a lot, so we are providing the, for the European the Galileo, the European constellation, uh, navigation constellation, we are providing the system that generate the navigation message, 
the, the most uh, critical part in terms of integrity. And on the other way, on the other side of the spectrum, we are developing the the, the, um, the positioning system for the, for the next generation of uh, BMW cars. And in the middle, all the, all the different areas we are able to cover. And the last point is uh, something that I think is very important for, uh, is the technology transfer and synergies. One thing that we have used in all the markets that we work is to transfer technology from one market to another. Uh, for example, uh, in most of the uh, flying dynamics operations, you can see the, if, the, if the operation center is, uh, is closed, you need uh, somewhere to get your information outside. So things like cybersecurity operations and uh, getting the knowledge from other, uh, other uh, areas of the technology, it would be important to be able to really have a mature market with uh, this information, the, this uh, STM uh, can uh, grow and uh, solve the, the problems that we are discussing today. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jose Miguel, for sticking to your time limit. Uh, next, we have Paul Lias from Estonia, who'll be talking about architecture for a global space traffic management platform. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for uh, having me here. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a concept that I have been working on the past years and uh, mainly it's not the official project, let's, uh, say, let's, uh, let's say. And I have been talking to policymakers, politicians and technology companies in Europe about, uh, about it. And uh, it's about how to build uh, space traffic management platform, so it's all about communication and uh, how to have a real example how such a thing uh, could be built. Uh, just for, your, for the introduction and uh, that you understand the background, and then uh, Estonian space, uh, so our history in space goes actually uh, back 200 years, but the main space related activities have uh, uh, started uh, more than ten, uh, 10 years ago when we started the first Estonian satellite project in 2008, which was, uh, and satellite was uh, launched uh, in 2013, and it was a very successful mission, and uh, it really kicked off our space activities in Estonia. Uh, just uh, two years later, we joined uh, the European Space Agency, and since then also our technology companies and universities have been involved in many uh, space projects and uh, industries growing. Today uh, I'm finalizing the space policy and program for the next eight years which will give the, a long-term vision so I'm just waiting for the signature of the minister so it's uh, as, as far, far as it can go already so it's, uh, it's in a very good position and uh, we will focus um, mainly on these topics where we can contribute to the space sector. So, for example, cybersecurity and e-governance are the topics, topics where Estonia is the leading, leading country. And, um, for example, we have NATO cybersecurity uh, center in Estonia, and it's, 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 it's a topic uh, where we can uh, contribute to the space sector. Then uh, autonomous robots and also material science in, for example, supercapacitors for, uh, for energy storage. And one of the next activities that uh, we ha are starting now is a national uh, space law. And now here the co combination of, um, because if uh, we are going to work on the national space law, then it has to have some practical value. And then I started to think about, okay, why should we have it? And then I understood that there is a clear, conne clear connection between the space law and our cybersecurity activities and e-governance that we could really build something with our al already existing building blocks. So, if you talk now about uh, e-governance, then Estonia has two unique services. First is digital ident identification, so it means a digital signature, so we know exactly who signed the document or who is using an application. And then data exchange, the same topic that was also mentioned before, how to exchange information between different, different actors and be sure that the information is still the same that was uh, sent. And exactly those two building blocks are necessary to build a space traffic management platform, at least in my opinion. 
If you go now more uh, deeper, then uh, the space traffic management uh, would be divided into two parts, two layers. First of all, registration. So the registration process of the spacecraft until launch, and then what is more interesting, of course, is the satellite operation if the satellite is already uh, on orbit. This kind of a service has to be uh, owned or operated by uh, national governments, and it's possible to connect the services be between each other. So it will enable that the national governments or the governments or international organizations will start exchanging information with, with, with each other and it will be secure. Um, now, if we go more deeper, then, um, for example, the registration process should start already during the mission definition so the satellite owner can understand that if the satellite he or she is building is, um, can be accepted according to national regulatories or internationally, uh, the government, for example, I will get an uh, approval that, okay, this uh, satellite can be accepted by Estonia, so we sign it, and we will, the system will automatically uh, notify everyone else, United Nations and also other, let's say, sat other nations or satellite operations that, okay, at this time point, the new Estonian space object is coming to, uh, going to be launched, and according to the, our knowledge, there should be no uh, uh, no threat that uh, there will be a collision, for example. So that we have done every, from our government side, we have done everything uh, to avoid uh, collisions. Now, if the satellite is in orbit, uh, then normally the mission control, for mission control, the commands are directly sent to uh, the spacecraft. Here in this case, the E service should be in between, so all the commands are saved. So you exactly know how the satellite was operated, which commands were uh, sent, and there will be two, uh, two kinds of actions. One is the agreed action, which is defined already during the mission definition, so it means that the government does not have to approve it again. And then there's another action, for example, the orbiting of a spacecraft, where the government has to give the green light that, okay, we can calculate that if you do it at this time point, there will be no collision. So it means that the government approves that, okay, it's our responsibility also that if you do it at that time point, you can deorbit it. And uh, of course, it will be notifications will be sent out to other, uh, uh, to other sat satellite operators so that everyone knows that this spacecraft is going to change orbit and there should be no incident. So everyone knows that, okay, uh, if, um, um, if the conditions stays the same, let's say, then nothing bad should hap uh, will happen. So in the end, if, uh, let's say, everyone <laughs> would start using this kind of a platform, which uh, will make uh, the exchange of information uh, secure and, uh, let's, say, let's say, streamlined, then the risk of collisions will be a lot smaller According to our Estonian experience, uh, such um, applications are, let's say, they're using it um, every day. So the question here is that something like that could be also used and in the space sector in the future. And of course, uh, governments using this kind of uh, application, at least in my opinion, uh, will have less, less uh, a smaller risk uh, against uh, potential claims if something happens because the government has done everything uh, uh, to protect uh, also other assets, not, not only their own. Uh, yes. So, so this uh, was the shortly uh, the concept that uh, uh, we are thinking of and hopefully it's uh, possible that uh, I will be able to develop this kind of, let's say, first uh, best practice and uh, start using it at least on a Estonian level. Thank you. Okay, next we have a, um, a little break in tradition. We're gonna have a two for our presentation. Um, we're gonna start off with Magazeta Pokoska. We'll be talking about recent Polish development in space with awareness. She'll be introducing her colleague who will take it on from there. So, Margareta. Thank you very much.
very much, uh, Victoria. Uh, first of all, uh, Diane, Moriba, thank you so much for having us here. It's a big pleasure and big privilege for us. That's our first visit in Austin, by the way, and it's 11 p.m. So we are so happy to be here and so happy to have uh, the opportunity to say a few words about our activities in space uh, security. Uh, I represent a military school which we just created, where we just created an institute of law, so I'm a lawyer. But my introduction of our presentation will be very, very brief because I know that most of you are engineers, so policy makers and uh, lawyers are, please be <laughs> out of this room. But, of course, uh, our role is also uh, uh, crucial and I think that our cooperation with my friends from Pulse, our Polish Space Agency, is an example that is there is a possibility to cooperate engineers and lawyers. So I, I wish you also this kind of cooperation, what we have in Poland. So, uh, first of all, let me uh, uh, say a few words about our uh, legislation policy in, uh, in our country. Of course, we are a member of EU, as you know, so we are obliged to follow European rules, of course, as international ones. So even uh, in, uh, in respect to the space policy, to the uh, space security policy, it's important to follow all rules made by international organizations responsible for space as the same for EU. So that's why all these parliamentary decisions or uh, other rules uh, like um, um, regulations or other kinds of decisions, hard and soft law, must be uh, followed by Poland as well. Uh, so uh, we'd like to show that uh, Poland is very active in space security, even though we are not the space powers like, for example, the US, but we are... Uh, having space security as our priority in our strategy, space strategy, in our um, documents referring to space in Poland, it's number one, uh, safety security of space. So that's why we are here and I hope we'd like to share a few information with you about uh, space uh, safety programs and, and uh, uh, security. Uh, in our policy, as I told you, there is some information about SSA. SSA is also one of the projects we are leading at our university under Minister of Defense uh, uh, supervision. So that's the uh, information, very important information from our ministry that SSA is important and it must be situated somehow in our uh, um, legislation. Uh, so we have some priorities. What, uh, one of them is... Um, SSI and SST support framework and the second one is establishment of SSA in Poland. So it's our uh, role as legal uh, advisors to uh, uh, help to advise how to make it possible in our uh, system. Uh, we have a lot of documents, of course, we don't have uh, here enough space for tackling all of them. But just to make you sh know that uh, we, we are part of uh, the uh, EU consortium responsible for SST. We have also created a space agency, which is maybe for all of you not something unusual, of, but for us it's unusual because it exists five years, uh, even a little bit more than five years, but it's, it's new. Uh, so we have uh, very active staff, we have very, uh, very um, uh, knowledgeable and uh, nice people responsible for making uh, space security. And uh, at the end of my part I would like to uh, show you some, uh, some milestones. One of them is uh, Pulsa creation in 2014. We also uh, became an EU SST member and we created an, our Polish uh, a consortium and my colleague will talk about it later. Uh, Space Agency Act was amended uh, a year ago, uh, so all activities are under Ministry of uh, Entrepreneurships and Technology, uh, so this is a very high level, very high priority for uh, this issue. So now uh, let me uh, pass the floor to my colleague from Polish Space Agency, Mr. Arkadiusz Himic, who I am sure he is one of the best experts in technical side of space security in Poland. Thank you very much.
agency, and I will briefly talk about the uh, uh, national setup. Uh, generally, we consider the three pillars, the national one, um, the European in, co in sense of European Space Agency, which for Poland is a member and co funds the activity there, and there is a third pillar uh, of SSA activities, that's the uh, European Commission. And as was mentioned a few times, we are a member of the uh, USST, uh, so uh, common European endeavor in terms of operationality in SST. Uh, our activities in Poland are based in, uh, can be divided to three areas. Um, the, sensors area, processing, and service. Uh, currently, I will talk uh, that the uh, subject of this um, uh, talk is related to development, so I will concentrate on the sensor layers because this is mainly, I, f I suppose, this is the in interest of, of you. So, uh, Polish community, uh, we, we have a sensor layer based on the public and private entities, which delivers data to Polish um, uh, operational uh, SSA center placed in Polish Space Agency. The, uh, all technologies um, uh, um, uh, developed uh, uh, by, by companies and public entities are related to European Space Agency. So in terms of small uh, medium enterprise, we have a free, there is a number of uh, Polish academies of science institutions and foundations. So uh, the, the global distribution of the sensor is uh, depicted on the, on the slide is um, based on 70 optical sensors and one laser station. Uh, all these activities uh, of sensors uh, are in the profit of European uh, SST community. Uh, the sensor related to Polish Academy of Science, Nicolas Copernicus Astronomical Center, are in the uh, Argentina, South Africa, and uh, Australia. Uh, thus, uh, uh, Adam Miskiewicz University, t uh, which cooperates, have a, a sensor in Arizona, and uh, building new uh, sense optical sensors, uh, most likely deployed into India. Uh, and if the companies, the, the six source company, have uh, six sensors in five countries, Namibia, Poland, Chile, Italy, and Spain. And there is uh, some development of the uh, robot, uh, robotic uh, new, uh, new telescope in the uh, Poznan Technology, uh, University of Technology. Uh, additionally, we have a, a laser station. We, I have a, an hour uh, with me here, uh, uh, Tomasz Suchodowski, who is a uh, laser chief scientist in Polish Space Agency. And there are some, some products, let's say. We, we, so we have a, this, uh, this, most of these telescopes uh, currently are fitted with an uh, uh, Abbott suit. Uh, this is the software to uh, manage the observation. The, the, uh, the new software is for astrometry and photometry is, the, is called Astrometry 24. We, uh, we are using this correctly, currently. Uh, there are some activities related to the observation of re-entries of re by optical sensors. This is a network we are just building um, uh, for observation re-entry. And are, because we are mainly based with uh, optical sensor, with these sensors we would like to use also for uh, near object uh, detection and characterization. Um, there are some um, um, results here related to laser observation of uh, cooperative and no uncooperative, this is uncooperative uh, rocket bodies. And we are building a few new sensors currently. We, there is a, one of new, is called Solaris 5. It's a, it's a new telescope most likely will be placed in, uh, in South Africa. So in terms of policy, we, we, we are building common uh, cooperation within the European Union and trying to, to uh, tighten relations with this last, last slide, with US, uh, both in the terms of the policy and uh, technological. And uh, we, uh, our efforts are concentrating, there's some sensor concentrating on laser and optical sensors, um, and all technologies related to the optical sensors. Beside this um, uh, sensor, network of sensors, we are trying to retrofit it and uh, uh, add new sensors to the, to the network. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you.
Thank you. And uh, next we have Yu Takeuchi giving a Japanese perspective on roles of key actors for globalist energy. Thank you, Victoria, uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, my name is Yu Takeuchi. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me start by appreciating Diane and Moriba for uh, having me here again this year. It's been a great honor for me. Uh, I'm also an international lawyer, but I'm trying to bridge the uh, technology and the law and the policy and, and the sort of things. But uh, I believe that today I'm here to uh, giving you some updates on the Japanese STM policy. So uh, Japan is, uh, I don't know how many, uh, how, how many of you knows that uh, we are the fifth country who uh, having the, our dedicated launch to the outer space, uh, dedicated satellites launching to the outer space. But, and uh, since we're having more than 50 years of history of space activities, but uh, the, the term, the first time, was the first time that the term STM appears in the, uh, in the policy is only in 2018, which was two years ago. And, uh, the very next year, which is last year, we, uh, the Japanese government uh, made, a significant, made several significant progress on its policy. The first one is uh, the MOD, Ministry of Defense Policies uh, Development, that they are already, not only that they are already decided to developing uh, SSA uh, radar uh, as, a, as a own assets, Last year, they uh, decided, first of all, to establish space domain mission unit within the Air Self-Defense Force, which, which, which can be the counterpart of the uh, Space Force in the US. But also, they are um, decided to start planning uh, SSA satellite program and a laser ranging system from the ground to space. So uh, they are now having two uh, advancing uh, development program for uh, security space utilization. But more than that, uh, Japanese government as entire governmental activities, last year they decided to uh, establish uh, Japan's overall S SSA system, which will be the uh, entire uh, whole of a governmental approach for uh, providing uh, SSA system, SSA services within the Japanese space community. The details have to be designed by uh, the cabinet office, the Minister of Defense, and the Minister of Education and Science, including JAXA. But the only thing that they decided last year is to start its operation from 2023. And early this year, uh, last, last month, we are, uh, uh, there's another news that JAXA selected Astroscale for commercial uh, active space debris removal partner. I'm not going into detail with this because I believe that uh, Charity will uh, discuss about that later on. And uh, as you can see that the, we have, uh, the Japanese government have excessive emphasis on SSA and space debris issues rather than the STM uh, policy itself. And uh, this is because, I, 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 would, I would say that this is because of its historical nature of uh, non-military uh, mentality. Because Japan is the unique country among the other uh, space foreign nations that what the, the country was keeping the non-military uh, perspective until 2008. So we have only 10 years of uh, history of uh, officially uh, considering the military activities in outer space. This is the current structure of the Japanese SSA operational system. You have uh, the red circle in the middle, which is the uh, developing SSA systems by the Ministry of Defense. And uh, you have in the left side, the uh, JAXA SSA assets, which are already in operation. So the Minister of Defense is, trying, uh, is uh, going to uh, 
uh, have information sharing cooperation together with the Ministry of, uh, together with the U.S. military forces, and uh, providing a, a SSA services within the Japanese community, space community. Going into uh, the regulatory aspects, which is quite fragmented, still fragmented, but we, we can see a kind of an element within those uh, regulatory, uh, regulatory assets. In uh, two years ago, in 2018, the Japanese government uh, established a uh, license system for launch activities and satellite operations activities. And within that, or during the process of uh, giving those licenses, uh, they included, in the review standards, they included several requirements relevant to STM. This slide shows the requirements for the launch vehicle design, uh, which, is, which contains two requirements relevant to STM. The first one is a mitigation of the generation of orbital debris through uh, design of the launch vehicle. And you can see as a number 17, which is the removal of an orbital stage of a launch vehicle, both for the LEO region and GEO region. And for the other um, license, which is a satellite operations license, the law requires uh, three categories of, uh, as, uh, of the requirements relevant to STM. The first category is the uh, spacecraft design requirements, which requires the prevention of interference with the control of other spacecraft upon separation or docking, or uh, the prevention of breakup in case of anomalies. Uh, together with, then those, those requirements have to be together with the space control plan requirement and the space control plan requirements also include the requirements for preventing the collision with another spacecraft together with the organizational structure in order to ensure that uh, collision avoidance. And at last but not least, uh, the requirements for the spacecraft end of life operation requires uh, to provide safety measures for controlled reentry as well as a vent residual energies in the end of life and uh, to provide measures for, for removal uh, from the Leo region within 25 years or immediate, immediately from the Geo region. So this is the overview of the recent updates of the Japanese, ST, uh, Japanese policy relevant to STM and I would like to uh, take this opportunity to uh, touch upon a little bit on the uh, 11th IAASS conference, which is coming to Osaka this year. So Japan, not only hosting the Olympic Games this year, but we are hosting the 11th conference of the International Association of the Advancement of Space Safety, which will be held in September at Osaka, Japan. Uh, this is the very first time in Asia, and we found that this is a very unique opportunity to expand the discussion of bridging the space safety, uh, regulatory issues, and uh, policy issues. So everybody uh, are welcome. Uh, the uh, abstract due is the end of April. That's it from me, thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Deva Real Daniel, who will be giving an Indian perspective on STM. Hello. Uh, I didn't make a presentation uh, because uh, whenever we have a presentation, it has to go through multiple re review committees and it comes out blacked out. So uh, finally, we end up uh, with a couple of side slides. So I thought it's, it doesn't justify the effort put into making these slides. So I'm just going to say whatever comes to my mind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, budget-wise, if you see, uh, ISRO uh, operates on a very small budget. So, and the majority of the budget goes to launch vehicle and satellite, and SSA is somewhere uh, in the end. So 
uh, and when when it comes to budget cuts like uh, for example this year 19, uh, 1920 we projected let's say x uh, when it was approved it was x by 2 but when we finally got the money like just before the allocation we got x by 4 and uh, when it c comes to allocation the majority is going to go to the launch vehicle and uh, uh, the next the satellite and other uh, uh, human space program and other activities and finally you get a, v a very tiny portion for SSA purpose. Uh, so uh, many places if you uh, see uh, we are actually fighting for ISRO's existence. Uh, uh, many people question the existence of ISRO in a country like India uh, which is considered poor and uh, uh, so we keep fighting for our very existence. So you might uh, hear Chairman, Chairman Isro uh, saying something like uh, we went to Mars with Uber cost. It would, it would look very strange for a, a scientific community. You may think what the peep he is talking about. So uh, it's, it's like you are trying to uh, defend your existence to a common man who uh, lives on like ten dollars a day, so uh, it's it's tough. So um, uh, in in this framework, this year we could manage to get a substantial amount of money for SSA, which is a big change in the uh, perspective of the government as well as the ISRO higher management. Uh, this I would say is because of. Uh, a few uh, very close approaches and accessibility to data. Uh, so uh, we, we felt that we should have something on our own to, uh, to at least negotiate with some other country. Like uh, if you want a data sharing agreement with a different country, you should have something to share. Uh, it, it was a very difficult time when we started this directorate, like two years back. Uh, uh, two years back like we were trying to find partners so nobody was willing to partner with us because there's nothing we can give to them it's like it's not sharing it's just uh, freeloading uh, so uh, that is why we started this netra project and uh, um, we are we are putting a radar and a telescope and uh, we should be able to negotiate or uh, able to partner with other countries very soon so uh, this is our status as of now. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Ralph Densley cleaning up, talking about UK version. Thank you, Victoria. Okay. Thank you, Victoria. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Diana and uh, Mariva and the organizers of this event for allowing me a chance to speak today. Um, and just like my colleague before me, I'm just going to talk off the cuff a little bit, although I do have a few slides. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Ralph Dinsley. Everybody calls me Dins. Um, allegedly, I'm the best dressed man in UK space, but I'll leave that up to your opinion. But I certainly have the best shoe collection in UK space. Um, and um, for my sins, I'm an ex-military space tracking practitioner, 32 years experience in the Royal Air Force. Joined as an air defender, uh, by chance went to RAF Filingdales. And on retirement, I thought I would um, occupy my spare time by founding a small company called Northern Space and Security Limited. Why Northern Space? Because I, want, I live in the north of England and I wanted to bring space to the north of England because it is very much focused on the southeast where our space industry is at the moment. That has become more of a lifestyle than just a occupy my spare time, I must say. Um, 16 years as a space tracking practitioner, I certainly got a, um, a, a taste for tracking objects in space, for developing SSA, um, and for the development of space traffic management. And in my final years in the Royal Air Force as a staff officer at uh, Air Command, I was heavily involved in both the Combined Space Operations Initiative and also the European Union Space Surveillance Tracking Framework. Um, and I'd like to add that the uh, UK hasn't left the EU SST yet. Um, we're in a period of transition, and once the negotiation is over, we will know exactly where we sit. We may have shot ourselves in the foot, but hopefully, in my personal perspective, um, hopefully we'll be remaining within the program in some shape or form. 
because after all, the UK does have the most powerful space surveillance radar in Europe. And it would be useful if we can collaborate with all our colleagues both on both sides of the Atlantic and uh, the North Sea. But I'm going to give you a personal perspective on developments in space traffic management in space surveillance and tracking and in SSA. I won't touch on SDA because I think that r remains very much in the military realm. Uh, and I think SSA should be something that civil space and commercial space should take on in spades um, and advance as we go forward. Um, and as I chat, I'd like to leave a couple of questions in your minds. Um, firstly, um, if SSA is so important, why are there so few dedicated SSA sensors after all these years of doing SSA and operating in space? Um, and secondly, Surely most nations already do space traffic management because having signed up and ratified um, the um, Outer Space Treaty, um, Article 6, I believe it is, talks about the responsibility of governments to supervise commercial entities in space, those that they have licensed, so there surely um, supervision is a form of space traffic management if we supervise. And I'll leave that thought with you there. So developments of space traffic management in Europe over recent years where we have the big program, the civil program, which is the European Union Space Surveillance and Tracking Program, which was a painful but wonderful adventure and continues to be. Starting off with five nations, just expanded to eight, may remain at eight, may go down to seven, we shall wait and see, but it has made some great advances. Developed on a plan to provide um, a European autonomy um, on tracking objects and looking after their own objects in space, but very quickly was realized it was needed as a, a collaboration suite so the Europe, Europe could actually contribute to what is a global requirement of space surveillance and tracking, uh, space traffic management, space situation awareness. Um, however, and I'll put a big however in there, in my view, my personal view, there is one issue, and that is it's based on legacy systems. And that's often the case of systems that are being developed from being utilized for one form to now being used to provide space surveillance and tracking. Great endeavor, and obviously with limitations and budgets and everything, at least we're achieving something and doing something. However, the big question is, um, where, when are we going to invest in new systems to be able to meet the challenges of today? In some instances, the challenges of yesterday, um, and very much the challenges of the future. Um, it's expanded to eight nations, but unfortunately the budget has not been expanded, so therefore it's spreading the funding thin across the eight nations. Bigger teamwork, which is great, but obviously that often requires bigger supporting funds. So it would be interesting to see how the European um, funding for space goes forward through their next funding round, because of course, sadly, at the moment, the UK has removed its contribution to that sort of thing, so that does add limitations to budgets. And there are greater terrestrial issues in a lot of people's minds. Our minds, the big issue is sustainability of space, but there are, however, greater um, terrestrial issues um, that governments will be put spending their money on. And I know in the UK, my nice little segue, the issue is focusing on how they develop now that they are extracting themselves from the EU framework as such. It doesn't mean they won't be uh, involved in some shape or form, and they don't know the costs. So it's a very unknown future. But our current government has grasped space as a great way forward. But to put priorities into perspective, um, they dedicated 92 million pounds to a feasibility study on a UK global navigation system. And in the past six months, they've dedicated tens of thousands of pounds into a small number of research projects on on-orbit servicing, um, active debris removal, SST requirements for the future. So have they got their priorities right? Certainly in my mind, not. And I was in the position two years ago to stand in front of the uh, head of the UK Space Agency and preach at him at a, a conference. It wasn't dedicated to me, but fortunately he was sitting in the front and center as I talked about the UK's responsibility to develop a sovereign and indigenous SST capability and not keep on saying we have a filing downs. Because it's a great system, but it sits behind that military firewall. And the important piece is we don't get all the information required from that military firewall. And unfortunately, most of the information that we don't get, we, they could actually pass through to us, but uh, the military have their requirements and their needs. We only have a 10-year-old space agency, which is based very much 
on um, research and development. So my company are leveraging some funding to do some R&D for optical and, and radar tracking, but they don't, they're not based on an operational function and capability. Um, hopefully they have ambitions to expand on that because they recently um, awarded a contract to um, a company for orbital analysts to support this very need within the UK Space Operations Centre and that programme is growing over the next four and a half years. So therefore, um, they really are funding money where I believe it should be. However, the big question is, will they actually add enough to that or continue to rely on the legacy systems that we have? The research projects that have been carried out by the space agency, sometimes I, I do wonder why they select certain entities in which to do them. And this morning, Dr. Kelso's uh, presentation spoke eloquently about many of the assumptions that occur within um, our community or just on the peripheries of our um, community. And I've been um, supporting a number of surveys where sadly the people that are running those surveys sit beautifully within those assumptions. And to quote one person that uh, spent half an hour questioning me about SSA and SST capabilities, he said apparently I was the first one that actually said that what we do right now isn't quite fit for purpose. And that really did surprise me. But we all must live with rose-tinted glasses. But the power, I believe, in the UK particularly, in Europe, and I'd say in the US as well, I think sits with regulators. Unfortunately, I'd love to say it's the SST practitioners, but no, I believe the power sits with the regulators. Because depending on what level of SDM you require, um, it still requires to go through the regulation system. There's been some interesting glitches in the regulation system in recent years, but I know in the UK, particularly the UK Space Agency regulators, are very keen to see how developments occur on uh, proximity operations, on, on orbit servicing, and to, to, to learn from how they can um, watch, um, learn from all the events that are occurring and how it can support them develop their regulation and how they can license um, intelligently, I suppose is the better phrase, so that they uh, can make their mind about who they're allowed to launch into space, how frequently. And I think that's a good thing. It's a good thing considering the fact that the UK has an ambition to be a responsible launch nation. Because if you don't have SSA, how can you be a responsible launch nation? So hopefully that will help them invest in it. But enough about me preaching about SSA and STM, and there is more than one slide. Let's make sure I get it the right way. And it's not moving. Try that one. Okay, so the next slide talks about the space law games. So, <laughs> myself with Northumberland University, uh, or my company in association with North, Northumberland University, um, have, are developing uh, a concept known as the space law games. It's thanks to Lockheed Martin in their uh, space traffic management uh, workshop, which has had four iterations in Scotland uh, over recent years. Fifth one will be later on this year. We came up with the idea of running space law games. And the whole idea of the space law games is to um, help influence governments and institutions on what they're required to do for space traffic management. And it's basically merging um, the idea of wargaming concept with moot courts, developing an intricate scenario, complicated scenario, running that scenario um, with the right experts in the right place, drawing the information you require to then pass on the data to create, hopefully, judicial quality uh, data to support the development of a moot court. The first scenario we're running, and the actual event will occur in Newcastle in June this year, will be um, a geo-event based loosely around um, what's been occurring just recently, actually, the, uh, the on-orbit servicing of uh, Intelsat 901. And the whole idea to, to make it a bit more complex than just removing a satellite from orbit, extending its um, fuel, and then putting it back into place again, an event will occur about a month after the on-orbit servicing piece has occurred, in which, in which point a third party will be damaged and they will want retribution and attribution. And can we provide the evidence to support the ensuing court cases? And finally, I shall mention another organization in the UK known as GNOSIS, the Global Network on Sustainability in Space, which is a Science Technology Facilities Council network developed to support and influence SST, SSA, and SDM within the UK. Thank you very much for your time.
questions before we do our important picture uh, at 445? And all right, we're out and running. Uh, actually, I want to start off just by asking the panel really quickly, and then we'll go to Q and A. What do you see as a priority for space traffic management internationally? What do you think we should be focusing on? The question earlier was, how do you prioritize issues? What do we focus on? What's the biggest concern that we have? Anyone on the panel? Data. In regards we, we to We need what? to understand what's happening up there uh -huh. before we can actually manage what's going on. So the data has got to be one of the most important things. Okay. Other thoughts? I agree here because it's the, uh, the most important thing is to is, yeah. it's Im important to share information between each other and not to hide your objects. So it's uh, to talk to each other and share information. It's uh, I think the number one thing and everything else, laws, regulations, they will come after. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? I would say common rules, mm -hmm. which is international, which is uh, makes it possible to understand in the international community. Back in my uh, my country, we uh, all of the uh, members of the international uh, Japanese space community requires or, uh, to having something uh, common understanding in the international community. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with uh, the more that, but uh, I would add uh, okay. like one additional view because uh, I think that uh, getting most of these women will be complex. Uh, but at least being able to talk the same language, define interfaces, things that we can improve uh, the data flow and the access to the information, even if we don't agree who, ha who is the responsible of maneuvering in a particular situation, uh, I think it's an easier uh, initial point that we can uh, work on. So we have data, we have cooperation, we have a common understanding. Anything else? Yeah, we support also the idea of data, so m most, uh, mostly we uh, we uh, invest in the sense of just to have it more. Of course, the exchange of data is important as well, and the dedicated uh, and operational sensors. Uh, this is also prerequisite to, to have it uh, good services and continuous service. Does a good international STM system need to have everyone with their own sensors, or is there a way of doing capacity building that can help share data? What do you guys think? I think that uh, not everybody has to have a sensor, so it's uh, just some countries who are contributing with, with this information. If everyone has, it doesn't make sense. I think in the end there would be too many sensors. This concept that I was talking about uh, before, here I think the point is that with this information we are getting from the satellite donors, for example, or operators, we are getting information about what's going to happen in the future which is even, so it's easier to predict uh, where are the objects going in the end. So I think uh, it's important to start understanding where is, uh, what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I would say that uh, the, our view is that there would be a different kind of scenarios and depending on the scenario, the answers would be different. Mm -hmm. We work a lot with uh, geostationary operators. At the end, the geostationary operators, they are only concerned about their box. Sure. If there is something crossing their box, they want to do something. In most of the cases, they want to do something that is uh, free. They change what they are going to do next week. They do the day before, the day after. They avoid the problem and they forget. If you are talking about constellation, and if you have, even if you have, like you tell said, you have uh, 50, 60 satellites, at the end is your boxes, what you are concerned. If you are working in a low Earth orbit, you have uh, critical missions like a science mission that is very important to keep the missions, or you have a constellation that you have a lot of different uh, uh, events, potential events. It's like uh, different problems, and uh, it could, mm, the main challenge is to be able to, from a market or from a uh, provider point of view, try to identify exactly what each particular uh, actor in the, in the STM uh, problem need and provide the right solution for them. And it's not the same for, for all, it, all the missions on, and all the regimes. STM needs uh, are individualized. Mm. Maybe not totally individualized, but uh, it is more than which is the big problem to solve. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very mm, tailored to the needs of uh, everyone. And I think it's something similar. ATM, uh, air traffic management is not a good comparison for all the things, but you, you don't do the same for general aviation, you don't do the same for uh, military aircraft, you don't do the same for uh, civil aircraft. So at the end, you need to customize the problem that you want to solve. We had questions in the audience. Go ahead, Mark. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I'd like to address my remarks to Mr. Daniel. Um, first, I'd like to say thank you for giving such an open and transparent and frank <laughs> discussion about the situation. Uh, we look forward to future Indian participation in international fora. Uh, the Indian voice has been quiet in the last several years, in my, in my opinion. Uh, but my question for you uh, would be go along with um, a couple things that, that Victoria said and what Din said about capacity building. I know you're, you're working on your own internal network, but uh, in my opinion, the Indian Ocean region is underserved, shall we say, with SSA sensors of, of radars and, and optical sensors. Have you considered um, inviting in some international commercial SSA partners that you could be landlord to that would allow, you would allow them sighting, but you would get maybe some payment in kind in that regard. That would be a low cost way to fulfill some of your needs and it would also provide the international community with some um, additional capabilities that are, that are lacking now. Thank you. Uh, I could uh, answer that with two, two separate answers. Uh, one is an official one, which I will just tell you. Maybe a, a, very, a very open one will be after a couple of beers. So <laughs> <laughs> the official one will be like, uh, we, we, can <laughs> we can take a look at it, but uh, uh, usually SSA people are kind of suspicious people. Uh, they have, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe it's because of the history and uh, how SSA came into being uh, because of the military uh, background. But SSA people are suspicious and I'm, I'm trying to uh, set up a telescope with uh, Dr. Moriba and it's, it's taken two years and still it's, it's, it's not operational. So uh, it, it's tough, it's tough to uh, get something like that in place. But I, I agree with you, it, it is a good option. That's my official. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is Dee from University of Arizona. So it's a pretty good talk that uh, we have people from industry, we have people from the government. And I have two questions. The first one is to uh, Jose, because um, you kind of represent like the industry and uh, the market. Um, so you talk about this market. And, and our uh, friend from India already like uh, told us all his story about like uh, fighting for funding mm -hmm. and all those like money thing. Um, and since you study kind of this like market, could you give us some like numbers about the expectation from your company about like the STM like carp, um, market capital, like some numbers there? What, what kind of expectation <laughs> people have there? And my second question is to Paul. Um, you showed us the framework of SA, um, Estonian uh, space, um, kind of government thing, right? So uh, I, feel it's pretty, uh, I feel it's pretty great. Um, but there's one thing that is missing, that is like you just assume like people will report all the maneuver to you, but what is your action if people do non-reported maneuver? That's all, thanks. So I can, <laughs> yes, I can start. Uh, no, honestly, we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, numbers, but it is so, this is also related because we are, uh, as I have uh, explained in the presentation, we are uh, operate like a very uh, horizontal uh, company. So we have technology in a, in a different places and we basically uh, follow the needs of our clients. So we have a very good uh, knowledge of the geo market. So I'm not, I, I'm not sure, but I think we are the number one uh, provider of flight dynamic systems for geostationary satellites. And uh, what we have is we answer to most of that uh, market. We also provide flight dynamics for constellations. And uh, in the last, uh, maybe in the 90s, uh, as when we started, there was just a very institutional thing. They were work, uh, concerned about the bridge, but nobody was concerned about the bridge, apart from some very specific institution. In the last uh, 10 years, with the Iridium Cosmos uh, event and all the, the traction that is getting this, uh, this topic, 
there are a lot of, uh, of companies that they start to, to receive a lot of uh, collision uh, CDMs. They are starting to have to really uh, think on, on the collision, or collision or SSA, STM, as something that is not a uh, um, particular situation, something that is part of the nominal operations. And when you have something that is part of the nominal operations, you have a lot of uh, satellites to operate. You try to make it uh, part of your uh, business model in the same way that they are uh, doing the, that with the regular operations. So when you are flying a satellite, you need to compute maneuvers every week. You need to make OB determination every week. You need to make a lot of operations that maybe 20 years ago it was almost uh, manual or the level of automation or the support it was very low. When they started growing the constellations, we provide systems that are more complex and they, re, uh, they allow them to reduce the manpower that they need for that operations. But the problems get simplified on that side, but then with collision awareness, it gets uh, more complex again. You need to add uh, functionalities to the systems. So our view is that these, uh, the, these uh, operational activities are growing and we have to provide systems to, to support that. But we are not approaching the market in a, like an investment fund or something like that that you need to identify which is the share of the market to decide if you invest on that or not. But it's clear that it's growing, in the, it's growing and uh, it will be an important segment of the space market in the coming years. It's a good question and uh, there's also, let's say, easy answer for that. So every country who is using this kind of, uh, let's say, service, they need to have a national space law which really says that if you want to, or it describes how you can or, or, or how you should register a space object, it means that you have to uh, enter this information to the e-service and it, the law has to say how the operation of the space object has to go. And if the companies, for example, aren't doing it, then of course there are other measures that governments can do. We've got one more here. Hi, I'm Mark. Uh, I'm an uh, autopilot guy. It's great to see, and I'm pleasantly surprised to see a flowering of SSA sensors, um, but largely siloed. We're smarter together. Are there ways to merge all the data, and is that going to be economically and governmentally accessible? Maybe Victoria can figure out. I think we could ask Mariba that question. How do, we, <laughs> how do we merge all that sensor data, Mariba? How, sorry, what was the question? I wasn't even following. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a way to merge all the data? Well, from so all the I mean, so, so here, here's the thing, right? I mean, uh, a couple of there's a couple of efforts out there in, in bringing uh, data together. Uh, I would say bringing data together is kind of step number one. How to, how to bring them into a common place. But then I think the even more critical thing is then how to map that into something that's usable. So, 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 so the data lake, uh, as it were, uh, it can't be a data swamp. It needs to be potable water. Uh, and that means that it needs to be curated and it needs to be mapped into common vernacular. And so there's all these things that need to happen, but it doesn't happen without first bringing it all together and then allowing people to compare and contrast and understand the differences and inconsistencies and oh well you got that answer and I got something different why did that happen like if that doesn't happen then we don't get to what you're talking about so uh, in order to get to kind of data f you know fused data curation we need to at least aggregate it first but uh, for now it's more of a coalition of the willing than anything else because it's um, by and large getting to the common pool of data that is curated and, and cleansed and all that Who's funding that, right? And the thing is, I don't know, I'm, I'm willing to step to the table to do something there, but how many people are willing to put their own skin in the game with the this promise that something really cool is going to happen at the other side? Um, it's kind of a chicken and the egg, but, you know, anybody smart knows that the egg came first. <laughs> 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 but I mean, one issue when you talk about data as well is that I, tend, I think we tend to focus on the providers of data and we don't focus as much on the users of data. Um, I know when we talk to people internationally, they'll say, look, we got this conjunction warning assessment. We didn't know what to do about it. So um, do we move or not? And so I think it's really helpful you know, when we talk about data using and fusing data. You also have to help with capacity building, the ability to use that sort of information. I think the USSP has been a great example for bringing um, disparate systems together to start working as one. 
Um, they haven't quite addressed the data pro piece yet. They're bringing that. It's sort of like the, ne the next level, the way I understand it. But the fact that they brought the census together and you had five different nations that started it, three that had, had traditionally done some sort of SS SST and two that hadn't. And, you know, and one developed immediately from a commercial side and uh, that, uh, Spain was the only nation that actually didn't involve its MOD, whereas the other nations all involved their MODs. So it was a great example of, of bringing these disparate systems together and, and beginning to get them to work together. And it's a good model to follow. Just don't take so long. <laughs> Apparently you've given them food for thought. Okay, so, so here's the thing. So I want to say two things. One, I'd like to thank everybody, Victoria and everybody on the panel. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. Round of applause, please.